This is John Reed, and I'm back in Las Vegas with my partner or my agent. I mean, I don't know what the lingo is now, Brian. Uh, Everything at this show is about partnership. So okay. whether we have a legal one or not doesn't really matter. It looks like uh, we have to talk partnership here. But is it an agentic partnership is my question. Um, but anyhow, uh, yeah. we are at Oracle Cloud World, if you haven't guessed yet, and we are on the tail end of a flurry of activity over the course of three days. So we're kind of on fumes. Brian's slugging down Dr. Pepper. But you got a ton of notes for us, which is great. So we're going to do a show review, and then we're going to tape a little ditty on the dark side of HR before we head out and find Alex Williams of the new stack for dinner. That should be interesting. So anyhow, uh, the first day was mostly Oracle NDA content for our analyst session, but then there was the opportunity to head over to catch a little bit of NetSuite action. And then you chase down a bunch of NetSuite stuff later in the show. And then I was spending a lot of time chasing down the gap between what Oracle says about AI and what its customers are saying, which is going to be the subject of my next Diginomica article. So, Brian, let it rip, man. What did we learn this week? Okay. Um, these are in no particular order, but I think we ought to make sure everyone understands it's all good. You're good. That um, we're in Vegas and in two different venues. Uh, they've been doing two different shows simultaneously. The NetSuite one right. that John referred to and the Oracle one. And, Sweet world and cloud world, technically speaking. Well, it's a collision of worlds. It's like it when is. planets collide. Um, it is. And, and it's great for personal fitness regimen as well. Oh, I guarantee if anybody wanted to get their 10,000 steps in it a day, all you had to do is go from one show to another once or twice. Um, and there's nothing like coming out in the crisp, bracing 100 plus degree heat with the forest fire smoke uh, blowing around us. And the smoke today, that was something else. And that caused some reordering of sessions and everything else. I don't want to bore everybody with this, but just let, I <laughs> just want you to know, collecting information at a dual event is a real challenge. Uh, so uh, we'll yeah. leave it at that. And yeah. We earned our miles. Yes. Uh, I'd rather earn frequent flyer miles uh, on my flight home than uh, get them by hoofing from one building to so the next. So one thing we all... One thing that we wanted to point out going in is that, first of all, this is a show like on both sides, NetSuite Oracle, massive in scope, right? So we have like an unbelievable amount of press releases to digest, along with the fact that there's so many keynotes that you could literally spend the entire conference in keynotes for different areas, whether it's HCM or mm -hmm. CX. There's also the whole healthcare angle, um, making sense of what's happening with that. And then, of course, all the infrastructure stuff, Larry's keynote was all about autonomous databases. The point being, we can't cover that off in this podcast, or, or Alex Williams won't be able to have dinner tonight, because <laughs> he'll still be waiting for us to join him at like 10 o'clock. So, yeah. so just for the listeners, we're going to have to pick and choose a little bit what we cover. But with that disclaimer aside, Brian, overall impressions, where do you want to start? Uh, Okay, there were some things that just kept popping up everywhere uh, when we talk about some of the advanced technologies. Uh, the one that, you know, I think uh, really is cool is watching them do all the narrative reporting and all the financial statements and other areas where you just kind of let the AI tool go figure out what you probably wanted to say uh, anyway. And then I saw example after example of that showing up in demos all over. They also had things to dramatically accelerate workflows and clean up integration. Uh, Saligo, who is a partner firm, there's partner uh, again, um, of NetSuite, was all over the uh, Suite World conference and showing uh, not just how they provide all this integration capability and tons of it, but how it's uh, gotten very fast, easy, and more powerful. Um, the uh, Let's see what else can I do? There were uh, there were other vendors out there that got got some notion. Uh, there's another one called another capability, the financial exception um, identifier tool, and this thing is running. Think of something running in the background that is identifying financial transactions that look a little hinky, like. Um, uh, Every time you got a bill from this one vendor, you always booked it to a certain account. And this time it went to a different account. 
and it's alerting people to things that, uh, you know, like, or maybe it's month in processing and you normally have these accruals and these reversals and yet uh, we're missing something. Is that really what you wanted? And it's a really slick capability that uh, finance people really kind of glom onto. That, that is a nice tool to have. Um, what else? Uh, I've got a whole list of them here. I'm trying to find ones. Um, I think a huge bit of discussion was around a lot of things Larry talked about on how just how incredibly big and powerful the tech stack is that Oracle's got. And not just the hardware and the data centers, but also um, uh, all the um, uh, large-scale applications, both on a horizontal and a vertical level, all the developmental tools um, you know, for building applications. You name it, they got the whole stack, and AI is like a component in the middle of the tech stack that can be applied all over the place. Now that NetSuite's products are 100% running on uh, that OCI stack, it looks like they're real close to getting everything running on the autonomous database. You know, so uh, that, this is creating a world of Oracle that is massive in its size, depth, and breadth. And it makes me wonder, how does any other, like a startup software company, ever compete with that kind of world? Yeah, and of course, that's been a really big topic of discussion, and AI in particular is like, do startups even have a chance when so much about the enterprise AI value proposition is about having massive data and being able to process it and, you know, whoever has the most customer data in effect has a has a big edge it depends on what you do with it of course but oracle thinks it has answers to that question through its cloud infrastructure as well and you know one of the points that i saw in a keynote today as i was passing through the press center and trying to not sit in another keynote <laughs> was them talking about how that autonomous database infrastructure is allowing them to lower infrastructure costs and essentially help them manage the costs of whatever you might perceive from AI, which is not a cheap technology, right? And so to your point, how does a smaller vendor compete with that? That will be a really interesting question. Um, I think it's a great one for like a Harvard graduate business school case study. Yes. Yeah. If you're, if you got a yen to start up a software company, how would you do it when you know you've got players like that out there? Right. Obviously this is built on the backs of the big news that was out on, um, uh, yes, uh, Monday, late Monday, I guess, when it was the AWS announcement that uh, was a little bit of a surprise, but the big surprise was seeing the CEO of the AWS uh, a unit coming out on stage with Larry. Uh, right. You know, that means the implication here is Oracle is now running its gear and so forth uh, and its solutions, its whole stack, everything is running in hyperscaler data centers from uh, Microsoft, AWS, um, Google, I think I'm missing one, but uh, anyway, they've got all the majors now. Yeah, it feels like just yesterday that Larry Ellison was throwing AWS under the bus at a show like this. And yeah, now, the, and now they're sitting on stage and everything, high fives and handshakes and uh, smiles. And, the bromance was blossoming big time. Um, it was, and then I thought, I, I actually don't need to spend a lot of keynote time on that. Um, I'm not a huge fan of like, here's our new romance. Yeah, but, partnership, excuse me. It's a Oh, sorry, it's a partnership, of course. But I did like when they brought JP Morgan on stage. I think it was really good to like, okay, here's a customer showing you an example of, here's a customer that lives in a multi-cloud world. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate to use that buzzword, but the point being that we're not going to just do business with one cloud vendor. I don't care who you are. So start figuring it out. So exactly one year ago today, I was here in Vegas with a client and we were at a different show. And what was fascinating was, even though I told the client personnel this like weeks or months in advance, when they got to the show, the light bulb finally came on where they realized we need to buy as much as we can from a single vendor because it'll make our ability to use AI so much easier to do. We won't have to map data from different applications, providers, 
to the AI tool if we, if we get everything that's addressable by one, which is, which that point d- didn't really get brought out that much in this show. It did show up from time to time because, but what it clearly shows is the market advantage now for customers, customers with brains that think about this is if you're still running with dozens and dozens of best of breed applications, you're kind of screwing yourself. Mm. You need to collapse it down to a couple so that when it comes time to train up your AI tools on the different data your company has, it's going to be a whole lot easier if you don't have so much diversity in the applications, databases, database structure, data models, et cetera. So let me walk you through a few details from a a customer story I did with, uh, that I haven't written, um, with Americold, because I thought it was a really interesting one. Um, and they had already made the transition to Oracle Cloud Fusion. One of the things I was struck by was, and they also have 20, 21 warehouse management systems. And I was really struck by how they talked about the, the CIO talked about the need for real time visibility. I found that refreshing because that's kind of a new school thing to talk about with ERP, right? Like why we did this. We want a more real-time visibility into all the systems. And I I find that refreshing because it's not really like AI talk, but it does put you in a position to do more stuff with AI. But you kind of have to get things where you can kind of actually see them operating in the same place. And so it was a really interesting chance to have that discussion. And they they they've been live now for a bit of time. They're not too far into those real-time uh, benefits yet, um, but they're getting there. But in the meantime, they had a they had a, a cybersecurity disruption of some major proportion, and what they said was that their their cloud-based systems fared a lot better their, than their on-premise systems that were affected by this. But it was fascinating to talk with the CIO who's juggling these things right on the one hand here's your forward vision Mm -hmm. on the other hand you have a major cyber issue that's affecting all of your customers and how do you deal with that and it turned out they really dealt with it i think really well from what i could tell from a communication standpoint and stuff but it kind of goes back a little bit to ellison's keynote which to a large part was about the threat landscape Mm -hmm. and and how to deal with it it was no more passwords kind of thing but there was a whole lot more to it than that and uh, I think it's interesting because I think that that kind of laid the groundwork for a really interesting discussion of like, we're pursuing this next gen real time enterprise, but I, I'm still a CIO. I still have to, job one is safety, risk, all that stuff. And then talking about AI got interesting as well, where he's talking about like heading into AI, but like giving vendors a hard time, like, why can't your AI help me clean up? my data so I can actually use AI. <laughs> I thought that was a really interesting, you know, potent question that I've talked about a lot before, um, but it's interesting to see it come up again. So uh, I asked a variant of that question to lots of different execs uh, for both Oracle and NetSuite, which is, yeah. hey, ha- how can we use your AI tools to convert all the data and figure out all the customizations your customers made to your old legacy products right. and help them move their operations into the cloud. And it turned out the answer was interesting. It's, well, yeah, we, we think about that periodically, but right now they have kind of a progression on where they want to take their AI capabilities. That's not their highest priority. And I accept that. Uh, it, it was just nice to know they were thinking about it. But yeah, there are a myriad of uses for AI. And it's really a question of prioritization, not only for vendors, but for the customers about what is it they really want, need, or get value out of, and seeing if those things align. Yeah, and the interesting conversation there was about, like, so I said to the customer, I said, you know, but you, a lot of times you need domain expertise to do that. So the, the sort of fantasy, like, that he had in this, I think it's not a fantasy in that it, I think it could happen someday is that the AI system would surface the anomalies and issues and say, hey, is this right? Is this right? And your domain expert would say, no, yeah, you can merge these two customers, merge these two fields. And some of this can be done automatically as per my conversations with Oracle this week. But I think it's a work in progress. But it's, I thought it was interesting that that came up in the context of like, yeah, this customer is really interested in AI, but doesn't necessarily feel across the board 
they're ready from a data perspective to do it. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. And the other fascinating thing for me was I went to an AI customer panel because uh, Oracle directed me there because I told Oracle, I said, it's time to show me some real world AI stuff that's happening now, um, not just what's coming. So they said, we'll go to the session. So I did, and they had a nice panel. But what I thought was interesting was after the panel, uh, the panel was good, but it felt like it could have gone on longer. And I was right about that because people gathered around the presenters, including the Oracle presenter. And it was fascinating listening to the unrehearsed questions that came up at that point. And it was things like uh, data privacy, where does my data go? Uh, how do I get my executives who are sensitive to this topic, like bought in? Um, there was some, the Oracle person gave her a good answer about the distinctions between how they train their own models, um, which, which never, you know, never like leave the environment and, and, and they, you know, they'll train those models with customer data, but which large language models, they don't train the data at all. And then I found out from Miranda Nash just now about log files and how external log files are not a concern for Oracle because they containerize uh, the LLMs within OCI. And so the data transfer never happens, but customers are super interested in this stuff. And this is what I keep telling vendors is, I know you're getting this stuff right, but they want the details. They don't just want assurances anymore. And I totally saw that uh, the last couple of days. And that's one of my big messages to Oracle and every other vendor right now is you don't need to sell AI so hard because customers are interested. You need to, but you need to give them open forms to get their questions answered and have real honest conversations. That's, that's a, what they really want. That's a, that's a really good uh, point. I, and, um, and I agree with you. I think, I don't think you need, you don't need to sell or convince them about AI, but what they do need help with is, uh, understanding how it's actually going to work. And I'll give you some examples. There, you know, and all these tools that can help you annotate, say, financial reports and give you all this analysis. Uh, at some point, a company is going to have to be able to say, uh, a CFO is going to have to say, I'm not signing off on these financial statements unless I know with certainty where every bit of this data came from, because I'm not going to jail over some extrapolated data some AI tool put in. So, we need that audit trail. And the other thing I know, I mentioned this to you probably Monday night, was I'm still waiting to see where this person in the middle of the AI workflows and processes is and how are they reporting the errors or the hallucinations or the other aberrant behavior that, or anomalous data that's popping up in this stuff. I, I didn't see it anywhere. And I even asked uh, Evan Greenberg about that over at NetSuite. You did Goldberg. I think. Yep. But, yep. Yep. And, um, and I didn't, you know, he thought, he thought, he, he said, I actually, you're in my article. I, if you guys want to read about it, read, look at my Goldberg article. I quoted you and I quoted his response. Okay. He, he said it was an important question. Um, but like you said, he, he didn't actually have that in the product yet. They have other ways of determining, as he said, what users like or don't like a feature, they can kind of tell, but they didn't have exactly what you're saying, which is the ability to report. I see a discrepancy. I see a problem. Right. You know. So I think more, the more savvy buyers are going to be looking for what I would call audit trail. They want to know where did this data come from? Is it, is it from our own internal database? Did it come from an outside source? Was it something the AI tool extrapolated or whatever? That's what they really, you know, I, th I think we need to see more conversation on that. So let me tell you briefly about my other customer interview with Hearst, because it directly relates to this. Uh, and the Hearst subject was a finance lead. So we got into a conversation because he's excited about some of the abilities to essentially process a lot of these kinds of uh, financial statements, like you were saying, but what happens if you get into trouble? So I asked him about that. Because I, I said one of my concerns is that with the techniques that Oracle is using, things like RAG and vector databases to limit the model's responses to specific customer situations, 
it likely will be accurate most of the time. So my question was, what happens, let's say it's 9 out of 10 or 99 out of 100 even, but this is about stuff pertaining to your finance reporting. <laughs> you know, that, that margin for error is fine when you're trying to predict consumer behavior or different things like that. Right. It's not okay for finance. So I asked him about that because he's a customer who's excited about this. And we got into a really interesting discussion about it. And, you know, and, and the, so the importance, in other words, the human, if they get too used to accurate stuff from the system, they'll, they'll, they'll fall asleep at the switch essentially and miss the inaccurate one, right? Because mm -hmm. it's almost worse if it's accurate most of the time. Because then you're going to miss that one time when it's not because you're so used to. So I said, what happens? And so we had a really interesting discussion about that. And one of the things he proposed was this notion of a tolerance level. So, so you, you essentially train the system that outside of a certain tolerance level, it's got to flag everything, right? Like it can't treat it as de facto truth at that point because it's too much of an an anomaly from your typical reporting. Like, maybe some kind of strange revenue bump or some kind of asset reporting that isn't like way beyond scope. Like, so I thought that was really interesting. I mean, he's just, he's a finance director, not an AI developer, but you know, it's just interesting to talk about like, how do you deal with probabilistic systems that are not dealing in certainty, but, but use them in an area like finance that requires certainty in many cases. So it's an interesting discussion and I don't think it's resolved. Like, so as much as vendors would like to say it is. So I'm going to go to touchy feely space for a moment, okay. which never gets covered probably in a very technical oh, right. show, let alone one where like Larry's giving big keynotes on technology. And that has to do with the, I, I saw lots of, um, well, almost 70% of the attendees, I believe was the number I caught at the Sweet World event were finance people. I mean, think about it, that's a lot of finance folks over there. And I asked a question at one of the panels about, so how many of you CFOs are doing something and dealing with the lack of it, the undesirable nature of a career in financial accounting anymore? You can't get any uh, college kids to major in accounting. Nobody wants to work in the big four. And why would they want to work for any of your firms if you're still working, making them work mm. six, seven days a week and working 70, 80 hours a week and you stomp all over their vacations and you constantly run through fire drills? When I'm asking the panelists, they're all kind of smiling and like, yeah, okay. And I go, so you bring in all these new AI tools and you make finance uh, like reporting and closing more efficient, more effective. Are you going to give people back their weekends and their nights and personal life? Or as your company grows, are you just going to keep the same staff, but then work them hard again? Right. You know, how do you hang on? You know, or, or when are you going to fundamentally change your practices right. to match the new reality and take advantage of the new technology? I got I didn't get the best answer out of that. And I think this is a problem where folks haven't decided what are we going to do with the time we free up because of AI and ML and so forth. And we're not having that discussion right now, and it's a really necessary one. I think companies need to be looking at. Yeah, because I think a lot of workers are at least intimidated enough by this technology that they that they they view it as a headcount reduction threat, even if it's not at this time. Right? They so they're going to work harder to try to show that they're not replaceable. Mm -hmm. And so much of it, I think, is on vendors and companies to articulate a future of work that feels humane and empowering, where the technology helps them to excel. Um, and that that vision is not very well articulated. And in many cases, it feels like the opposite, where it's like, oh, it's going to create all this stuff. And it's like, creative stuff is a real hot button topic for me, because if the AI, if the AI is doing your creating for you, what are you? Are you just an administrator? Um, <laughs> are you some kind of uh, fault resolution specialist? Um, so what what what's left of your job exactly? And I think the companies that do best with this, this technology, in my opinion, are the ones that are going to be able to articulate this in a way that gets their workers excited about the future and not sort of dreading what's next, which I think a lot of workers are, unfortunately. So, well, I'm going to circle back for a moment to 
one of the early themes, partnership, that we heard about oh, again and yes, again. Partners, the show. indeed. Sa Safra brought that up a lot too. Uh, Evan talked at NetSuite about how they now have a Salesforce connector, and some of the analysts were like, "Yeah, but you have your own CR, you know, CRM kind of module in there." Yeah, he goes, but there are also, you know, all these gazillions, you know, Salesforce deals, and they're now becoming a more partner-friendly company. At the same time, over here on the Oracle side, I saw um, they were doing uh, other partnerships, and oh, I lost my note on some of that, but um, they had a fair share as well. Even the one, obviously, the, the one they did with AWS was just like head scratching, you know, because Larry has done such a tremendous job over, you know, at prior Cloud World and Oracle Open World kind of shows. Yeah. Beat on uh, Amazon. So the new reality is everybody's partnering with everyone. Uh, but uh, that's all to get the data and the AI kind of connectivity to go. One of the point you brought up, though, latency a moment ago and i wanted to add in this it's odd to hear people talking about latency in particular how it impacts ai tools because uh if somebody's looking at a combination of real data and ai data on the same screen or they're asking a chat bot for example like what are you predicting off our sales well if the ai hasn't picked up on the latest numbers it's going to give you possibly a skewed answer if your latest numbers were really good or really bad, you know, and someone's going to look at that result and go, huh. Anyway, it was just odd hearing people talking about latency and how it impacts AI, and then that will impact the kind of quality of the results coming back to the business decisions somebody you're going to make. Yeah. So listeners might want to be adding that to your list of things to ask and torment vendors on. Uh, on how they're going to handle the latency and AI issue. Yeah, indeed. You have a checklist you published that has about 50 more of those questions <laughs> for those folks who want to dig in deeper. All right. I'd like to put a wrap on the Oracle NetSuite review. Brian, have a quick look at your notes. Did we miss any of your scribbles that you can um, still read? Nothing right now that jumps to the level that we need to keep continuing on here. Um, can I give a couple of quick stats? I found out that there are about uh, 10,000 Fusion Cloud customers. So they're making that migration over there in a pretty aggressive way. That there are 40 artificial intelligence HCM kind of apps that they announced in like January or whatever and are available. And um, one of their execs said yesterday that customers can activate uh, 40 of those in about a minute is all it takes to get those things activated and good to go, ready to run. Let's it's add just, just a couple more quick stats since we have the stats going. Mm -hmm. Oracle uh, has 50 plus uh, generative AI uh, apps slash features embedded in its product. Mm -hmm. um, Oracle uh, gave me a slide that I'm publishing on that in my AI piece today, so you can check that out later. And then um, Oracle announced 50 plus AI agents. We don't have time to debunk and discuss agents in this podcast. Uh, that's a whole other topic. And I'll try to get to that in my editorial. 50 plus uh, new agents. Specialized AI agents embedded in Oracle Fusion Cloud help organizations reimagine how work is done, Brian, across finance, mm -hmm. supply chain, HR, sales, marketing, and service. I have some warnings for vendors about overdoing it with AI agents for a variety of reasons, including don't over automate stuff that's not ready to be over automated yet. But it, it is interesting and it's about shifting from just insights to taking actions around stuff. And that's a much longer conversation uh, that we're not going to have right now. But the one thing I do want to say, because I kind of poked a little fun with Oracle around its buzzwords, is I do think they're getting pricing right. They're, they're you know, not charging for embedded AI. They may charge for add-ons and stuff like that, but when they're embedding AI in product, they're not going to charge for that. It's basically, you get it for your existing licenses. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is the future, folks. So vendors who are trying to charge for that type of AI, there's a couple of vendors that are not, and, and a lot more, I think, that are. I don't think that's going to work. Um, I, it's, you know, Miranda was making fun of that in the press conference today, and he's right. I mean, like, the idea of like, oh, 
here's your modern general ledger. But if you want the real modern one with AI, you got to pay. It doesn't make any sense. It's five years from now, you're just it, the AI that actually works, that helps people. It's just going to be in your stuff. It's going to be in your phone apps. It's going to be in your business apps. There's not going to be some surcharge. So you might as well start there. So anyway, I think that's smart on Oracle's part. We'll see how the market responds. We'll see how customers respond. Maybe that and toll charges or egress fees will start to go away as well. Um, yep. Anyway, like you said at the top of the call, this is a uh, this was a massive show from a massive vendor covering two massive business units with full stacks and all the synergies that can work between each other. There's just no way any one human being or even a small team could cover all the news that's uh, fit to capture here. So um, I hope the listeners got something out of this. Uh, yeah. Needless to say, it was, it's been a fast and furious last few days. Indeed. We did our best, folks, and the rest is on the cutting room floor somewhere. <laughs> but we'll try to make sense of it on our future articles as well. Uh, so now I'm going to shift gears. I'm going to talk with Brian for a few minutes about HR the dark side of HR with HR tech shows on the horizon, and then we're going to go to dinner. <laughs> 